I'm sad uh, that we uh, need to move on to this next session because uh, I really uh, was very, very fond of, of Michael Levy. Uh, but I'm also uh, very happy uh, to be able to, to honor him uh, with this uh, inaugural lecture, Mike Levy lecture. For all of you who consider yourself endosonographers, um, if you don't at least know Mike Levy through the literature, uh, then you need to, to start reading more. He was really a prolific publisher um, and uh, really made a, a huge impact uh, in therapeutic endoscopy as well as the U.S. Um, Mike is, uh, was born in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, which is where I spent about 20 years of my career. He did his medical school and undergraduate training uh, at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. And I think everybody who knew him, he was an, an avid uh, Gamecock fan, uh, very much so in football and, and other sports as well. He did his fellowship in gastroenterology at the University of South Alabama in Mobile. And then uh, he was one of a, a, a fairly small group of people. Uh, at that time, you di did either an advanced fellowship in, in uh, EUS or ERCP. Uh, but Mike chose to do both. Uh, he did a, an ERCP training in um, uh, Luke's Medical Center in Milwaukee, uh, which is uh, Joe Geenan's uh, unit. And then he went to the Mayo Clinic and worked with Moritz Wiersema uh, to learn uh, EUS at the Mayo Clinic. And then he stayed there uh, throughout um, his career. He was known most for EUS. But in fact, he was an interventional endoscopist and a, a reportedly a, a really, really good uh, ERCPist. Um, he trained a lot of fellows. He was very cerebral and, and had a, a large group of fellows who came through uh, who he mentored. He was particularly uh, interested in, in uh, understanding the literature. He was a prolific reviewer for gastrointestinal endoscopy on three different uh, occasions. He was selected as the reviewer of the year for GI endoscopy. He chaired the editorial committee uh, for the ASGE for GI endoscopy. So he was uh, very, very much engaged in reviewing the literature um, uh, and was recognized for that. Uh, before he passed, his uh, latest passion was AI. He felt that uh, AI was going to make a, a large impact uh, particularly on uh, accelerating the diagnosis of cancer and improving outcomes. And he, he actually had produced several uh, algorithms uh, with uh, what's called convolutional neural network, uh, which is a part of AI, um, and uh, developed some programs to differentiate uh, autoimmune pancreatitis from pancreatic cancer. Um, he was a very humble uh, individual, a very quiet, uh, but very cerebral, um, very kind, considerate. Uh, he was um, a, a, a quiet person. He kept a lot uh, to himself, but um, when you sat down with him, uh, he was uh, just a wonderful person to be around. He attended virtually all of our, uh, not attended, he was on faculty for all of our EUS courses, but I think one in which he had some health issues. And I remember really from the very beginning when when Shyam and I would sit down and, and figure out what faculty we would invite, um, uh, he was always uh, one of the first people that we said, yeah, we got to have Mike Levy uh, at our course. So um, it's an honor to, to, to have the Mike Levy lecture. Uh, it's an additional honor for me uh, to be able to introduce uh, the, our first um, Michael Levy Memorial Lecture, um, and that is uh, Thomas Roche. Um, there is probably no one uh, who's had a greater influence on, on my career, uh, particularly in EUS, but, but also just philosophically and, and in general than, than Thomas. Um, he had a long tenure in Munich. Uh, he had a long tenure as the editor of uh, Endoscopy. He heads up uh, Endoscopy now in, in Hamburg. But he's, um, uh, just like Mike, a, a very cerebral individual, somebody who um, it, is really concerned about the quality of research and quality of literature, and I, I think that um, this is borne out in, in uh, the way he's um, sort of aggressively done very good trials throughout his career. So um, we've asked uh, Thomas to talk about um, uh, radiofrequency or ablation, uh, tumor ablation, 
uh, and uh, what would you do, should we do to move this discipline uh, forward? So, uh, Thomas, it's um, a great uh, pleasure for me to introduce you uh, uh, to the Mike Levy Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob. Um, it's a big honor for me to uh, give this lecture. I took the liberty to widen the topic a little bit uh, to US-guided tumor treatment, um, and not only ablation, because there might be more options. So if somebody leaves us whom you know, you met a few times, but not really a friend, um, if you look at the picture, how would you, like we are used to interpret endoscopic pictures? Uh, I think this shows very nicely the mixture of melancholy and curiosity, which was characteristic uh, for Mike, I think. And uh, what a person leaves, I think, uh, is, is a scientific legacy. And uh, Mike, as, as Rob mentioned, was very focused. A lot of research on pancreatic cancer in the US and um, uh, very pleasantly uh, off the, the normal paths. So he could show partially why this is such a dismal disease. So he published a lot on the extent of the disease. He could show that pancreatic cancer grew along the nerves, even distant uh, from the main tumor. And also around the vessels, he could show that there, in, in some patients, there, there was tumor tissue and he biopsied that, and unfortunately, this didn't have much consequences, and, and it was not incorporated into the routine, but I think this should be looked at more carefully in the future. He also, besides AI, his uh, latest interest uh, did uh, a lot of FNA studies, uh, heading the way to a more differentiated use of the material we're getting. But he was also honest enough to at uh, some issues, what could we do, which harm could we do to patients? And that's a very interesting approach because there's a, there's a lot of research on circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor DNA. And he looked at uh, US guided FNA, what happens, and in fact, in a few cases, there are tumor, there's tumor material in the circulation induced by US. What consequences that has, we don't know, but I think it's interesting to look at that. What I particularly liked is um, his approach to uh, cystic pancreatic tumors uh, treatment. There was a time where people put all kinds of substances into the cysts, which were mostly benign, so the indication was very questionable. And uh, Mike was one of them who, with his group, could show that uh, this may not be effective, then, uh, because in this small study there was a complete resolution uh, of the cyst morphologically in only a small percentage. And also then people, I don't know whether you remember, they said, okay, we, we put alcohol into the cyst and then we take some operated cases looking at the effect and see we were very effective because there was not everywhere epithelium. So we killed part of the epithelium. And then Mike came and uh, looked at surgical cases without anything of cysts, no, no ablation before and he could show that there was no epithelium a priori in a, a variable percentage of them. So this uh, shed some, some doubt on this treatment, and I think, Rob, it's vanished in the meantime, isn't it? Uh, so we don't put uh, terrible substances into harmless pancreatic uh, cysts. Okay, so, so what's about the area of eos guided pancreatic tumor treatment? Unfortunately, there is not very much uh, clinical, although I think that the, we all know that it has a very poor prognosis. Uh, on the other hand, it has, it has slightly improved. So we, when, we're, uh, when we were young, the expectation of survival was three to six months. This is now with a lot of chemo and many small steps, substantially longer. But still, almost all patients die. Um, what we have to show uh, with any therapy, and it's uh, probably mostly multimodal, is a survival benefit for, for palliation at the end, or in some cases, downstaging to enable surgery of tumors which were deemed irresectable at the beginning. Whether this finally improves prognosis uh, in which term ever or just keeps the patient longer in the hospital, we don't know. 
And if we do studies in the area, there are the high standards of oncologic research uh, and much less uh, the, the, the marketing studies we uh, sometimes are used to do. So these are the methods, injection therapy, ablation therapy, and, and some others. There is a long list, if you look in the past 20 years, of anti-tumor agents which uh, have been injected into tumors. Most of them were based on the fact that there were viral carriers or others that the T cells or natural killer cells were activated to influence the tumor via different ways or sometimes classical chemotherapeutic agents like emcitabine or paclitaxel were used locally. Um, there are, of course, possible advantages to do that. that. We could achieve a higher concentration in the tumor with a possibly higher effectiveness, perhaps lower adverse events. Uh, how well that is uh, distributed uh, throughout the tumor, we don't know. And, of course, uh, most of those agents I've shown to you before are only for local use and not uh, uh, systemic uh, use. Um, still, the literature consists of uh, case series, not very many, but um, with some effectiveness. And none of that path was uh, actually followed. What I found most interesting, because years ago there was a German group with ENT tumors, as another experimental approach which never less, uh, left the, uh, the lab, and that's the use of magnetic nanoparticles. Um, these particles were coupled to antitumoral agents and then applied intravenously, and then there was a, a magnetic stick placed into the pancreas which extracted the nanoparticles with the drugs to the pancreas, and then, of course, the challenge was how to release the agents, and these were a few experiments we were doing a long time ago where we could show that this works but then it got sort of beyond our scope. We are simple endoscopists and you need a huge lab and pharma and, and then the thing died away. But, but the principle, I think, is very, very interesting. And the, the main challenge here is if you extract the drugs with the particles that they are released in an active form and can then exert their effect. So we haven't come that far, but I still find the area interesting and we should not give up. Radio frequency is the other technique, technique which might be closer to our feeling. It's a completely endoscopic technique, so we put a needle in there and we burn the tumor. Um, mostly applied in neuroendocrine tumors, sometimes also in adenocarcinoma. Uh, as uh, radio frequency is concerned, we have the typical phenomenon. We have no randomized trial, but nine meter analysis collecting all the um, pseudo-evidence of retrospective case series of those entities and the outcomes used are variable and mostly short-term and mostly also limited to morphologic assessment. And uh, as I said initially, I think in oncology other parameters should there be at least at the end. Of course, if you start a trial, you, you then have to, to live with simple parameters and see uh, whether, uh, what um, happens. But maybe at the end we have to uh, question whether shrinking a tumor makes any difference or whether finally patient survival, no appearance of metastasis or other parameters should be taken into account at least at a stage where this uh, goes into more clinical studies. Here is one of those meta-analyses. Um, um, collecting 10 studies. Some are called prospective, although they don't have any characteristic of a prospective study, like case number calculation, study aims. They're just, you know, uh, retrospectively analyzing prospectively done endoscopy reports, and it's a mixture of tumors, and the response is uh, assessed only morphologically. There's also something called clinical response, which is difficult to assess, and the adverse event rate is... Um, tolerable. Here is a, a systematic review of the treatment of pancreatic cancer where no real conclusions are possible, unfortunately, case series, but it shows that something is happening at least, and uh, if you want to know more, I think you have to speak to Paolo because he's an enthusiast in the technique, 
and they could also show that something happens with the immune sy system if you burn a hole into pancreatic cancer. But as I said, initially, the, the final study would be that there's an oncologic benefit on top of um, uh, the usual uh, uh, palliative chemotherapy, which is possible, but it, it has to be shown. And um, I think the neuroendocrine business is more promising because these are usually smaller tumors. They are more easy to reach. Although most studies mix the non-functioning and the functioning tumors together, which you can do, but the outcome parameters are very different. If you have an insulinoma with symptoms, you have an immediate clinical effect, whereas the treatment of smaller neuroendocrine non-functioning tumors is, uh, at least when they are smaller, uh, critically viewed and should probably not done. So. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see that there's a study protocol for a randomized trial in, in these tumors to compare it with the standard of treatment of pancreatic insulinoma, given the fact that there should be an indication to do something at all. So, what can we learn? We haven't come very far, but I think it's still an interesting area. What could we learn from Mike? I think he focused uh, a lot. He didn't do meta-analysis, as far as I uh, could uh, uh, see from a literature search. So do good clinical research, not retrospective case series followed by meta-analysis, and remain skeptical. And if we try to apply this to tumor treatment, um, my conclusion wouldn't be negative at all. I think, yes, it's promising, and, uh, but it's hard because uh, it has to do with pharmacological agents. It's beyond our scope, unfortunately, so maybe we should team up more with oncologists and telling them, hey, we have the possibility to bring something on site in addition to what you're doing, not instead, but in addition. And there, finally, of course, there's a need for good studies in the field of oncology. Thank you. So I'd like to ask uh, Vivek Kambari uh, to come up and uh, present uh, Thomas with, uh, uh, with a plaque.